And uh, if you would turn to page 97, um, I'm actually going to read this because I haven't figured out a better way of introducing our next speaker. On September the 2nd, 1998, 229 people died when Swiss Air Flight 111 crashed into the ocean near the town of Peggy's Cove in Nova Scotia. In the months following the disaster, Dr. John Butt oversaw a team of doctors, pathologists, dentists, X-ray technicians and Mounties who worked to identify the remains of the victims, but used the most advanced techniques of matching DNA to come up with positive identification and forged relationships with the grieving families. Dr. John Button. <clears throat> Good morning. I don't know whether this represents the people that didn't drink or the ones that have the most Tylenol. <laughs> I, um, man, what a great group. Um, well, we've talked about a lot, haven't we? A lot of stuff. A lot of ideas, and uh, but um, nobody's talked about death. Dr. Death. Oh, very nice. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what Moses mentioned, which is in your program. I'm going to tell you a little bit about forensic pathology as well, but not very much, because you'll see some of it in action. I was um, a reluctant doctor. Um, I was delighted on the first day when Joe McGinnis talked about his medical school career, which uh, I had a, a poor career in medical school. I was a rotten student. I didn't really know whether I wanted to be a doctor or not. It came out of the family. My father wasn't, but my mother thought I should be a doctor, and uh, I thought I ought to be a steam locomotive engineer. Uh, that's a fact. Last week I um, had a, an incredible experience that took me back many, many years. You're going to hear about this, but not from me, but there's a wonderful restoration project going on on the West Coast involving a magnificent locomotive that Canadian Pacific is bringing back to celebrate its new image as a historical entity in Canada, they're bringing back this locomotive. And man, did it ever give me a did it ever give me a thrill? It's being done like a like a work of art. I uh, I resented the education that I had in medicine. I was 19 years of age when I went to medical school. When I was actually in medical school, they nearly had to burn the place down to get rid of me. Um, I. I failed one year. I got asked to leave on another year. That's a fact. Um, it's crazy when you look back on it. I'd, I don't think I'm any kind of a special doctor, but I've enjoyed every bit of it. I like it. And um, I'm in one of the narrowest, one of the smallest corners that you could ever find in medicine. I have no education whatsoever in the arts, and I resent it terribly. The humanities, I, 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 I come by it only out of maybe my heart, but not really out of my mind. I don't know anything about the performing arts or anything really other than medicine, and I just think how awful that people in medicine were educated that way. And thankfully now, there is an allowance that allows people to go into medicine without being challenged simply by chemistry and physics and mathematics. And so now if you decide that you first of all want to be an architect or a priest or whatever, there's a place for you, which is wonderful. The bedside is a great place. It's the laying on of hands, and it's 
a precious gift uh, for a doctor. It's not a right, it's a precious gift. And when you give it up, like I gave up the bedside to go behind a closed door, and the door is closed. None of you have, few of you have been behind the door that says autopsies or morgue. You give up the laying on of hands, and this is an important thing that I want to talk to you a little bit about. And when you put your hand down in the morgue, what you have is something that's terribly cold. And so, how to forge a relationship with anything that actually speaks to you and even esteems you in your work, which is part of the exchange and laying on of hands between doctors and patients. It's very difficult to do, and I remember when I palpably closed the door and went to the morgue, and I remember saying to myself, well, you're giving up an enormous amount. I was um, a forensic pathologist in the United Kingdom. I'm Canadian, but I did my training in the United Kingdom, and I was upset by the exchange between what you would call Scotland Yard, which is actually simply the Metropolitan Police and their work as officers to the coroner and the fact that they spoke without much heart, coldly to families. And I, I was upset by it. It didn't really mean that I could do anything about it, but one day after I came back to Canada, I had been thinking very seriously in establishing a medical examiner system in Alberta of having nurses as investigators instead of whatever else they had been before, including police officers like they were in the United Kingdom. Uh, and it worked very successfully, these nurses, because they had the skills to talk uh, properly to people and they knew the language and they well, you know about nurses and their terrible trials at the present time, which is just a dreadful, dreadful endorsement of the way we treat people. It's just a disgrace. Um, <clears throat> one day in 1975 or 76, I was still subscribing to the Guardian Weekly, and I have in my mind a letter that remarkably appeared in the Guardian Weekly, which in part said as follows. We were quite appalled by the world of coroners, pathologists, police officers, and the real world of mothers, fathers, brothers, and sisters when it came to dealing with the death of our son. And I still show this slide when I talk to people about the issue of death and the work of the medical examiner, and so you're going to see a little bit about that. Despite that, I became a pathologist behind a closed door, and when it came to talk to, to parents about the death of their infant in a crib, or their son who died on a ski hill, I hid. I hid. I hid myself from it. It just hurt too much. In 1986, via rail crashed a train into or Canadian National crashed a train into via rail just uh, outside Hinton, Alberta. And I was exasperated by the media. And um, actually, I have a book here that I want to read to you. I don't, I put it down, I think of magazine. Um, have we got that? I'll put it over here. Well, in any event, um, maybe it's in my little case there. Could you? I'm sorry about this. Um, I, uh, maybe in here. Thanks so much. I, um, 
I did something that I didn't think was a bad thing. The media were hanging around and they wanted to see another body. And so I said with others and we made a body with towels and put it under a sheet and brought it out for the media in the hope that this was the last day that they would be on the site with what I deemed, I deemed to be their relentless pursuit of something that was macabre and that they had to put on the front page of the national newspapers. Well, when the Edmonton Journal wrote an editorial, having found out about this, they thought that I should be fired, and I never understood why they thought that. It took me from February of 1986 until September of 1998 to figure it out, believe that or not. And then, if we can have this clip, um, I have to tell you um, that I carry with me an emotional scar, but it's a good scar. And so you will see probably here uh, in me a reaction that I really don't have much control over, but it's a good scar. It's not like I was cut while I was being robbed. It's more like uh, I had a surgery and it cured. That's the kind of scar I mean. So if we could look at this clip, I'm then going to read you a couple of lines from this which is an Esquire magazine and brilliantly written. Hundred and twenty-nine people on board began to drop from the sky. Maxine Capola. We're up to forty-four body bags at this time. Uh, As body parts were found, they were flowing to Shearwater Air Base near Halifax. Remnants of saliva or hair or sweat. Let's expect to identify every person on board. Something almost unheard of before now from such a massive crash site. Um, Michael Paternity, who, interestingly enough, um, I, I'm, I'm sorry I can't remember the name of the neuroscientist who spoke on the first afternoon, if you remember, about Einstein's brain. Michael Paternity, who wrote this article in the Esquire magazine, actually, I believe, wrote a book on the travels of, Esqu of, uh, the travels of, of uh, Einstein's brain across the United States. Some of you may have read this. Um, but in any event, he's a, he's a good writer. Something terrible was moving this way. If you had been standing beneath the revolving green light on that early September night in that plague of clouds, you would have heard the horrible grinding sound of some wounded winged creature Listen to it trail out to see as it came screeching down from the heavens, and then suddenly an explosion of seismic strength rocked the houses of Peggy's Cove. And that was, uh, of course, Flight 111, the crash of Flight 111. Um, I was at home, and I lived very close to Peggy's Cove. I, I'm going to show you the devastation, and you will be surprised. I think that you'll be a little bit upset, but I'm not going to show you anything that is so terrible that it will mark you. But uh, this is the debris that was floating around in the Atlantic Ocean. This is the sweater, for those of you who have seen the CTV uh, docudrama on Swiss Air. This is the sweater. The next slide is a x-ray of what is actually a fairly large piece of the human remains. And a year later, when it seemed like everything had been done and the Canadian Transportation Safety Board decided to put a dredge on the site, they brought in the Queen of the Netherlands, and this is the material, the human remains that was in the mud. This next slide. 
Um, this, I put this slide in here to uh, show you the dreadful fragmentation. There was only one intact body in Swiss air, and it presented an enormous problem. I'm not going to go on and tell you any of the scientific issues. There were huge um, issues in terms of logistics. There were huge issues in terms of uh, bringing people together. It was a very successful, if one can use that word, a very successful um, handling of a disaster by a large number of people, and I had the, the honor to, it was an honor to, to be the leader in the mortuary, which uh, you will see the outside of it. I'm not going to bother showing you the inside. There was incredible energy. In the first place, I was, uh, I was scared. I was terrified. Uh, I remember the first evening. Um, I was at home and I paced back and forth after the phone call came, uh, incredulous of what I had heard, and, and to the point that I, while the adrenaline began, I, 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 I didn't want to believe it. I couldn't fathom that Swiss Air would even be near Canada. You probably don't know, but. Um, there are about 600 flights a day over Nova Scotia because of the great circle route between the eastern United States, so maybe it was inevitable that one of them would fall out of the sky. A rather unkind gentleman, I, and I feel a bit um, wrong-minded in even mentioning it, but there, wasn't, there weren't very few people around that were difficult, but there was a difficult man. And he came up to me and he said, uh, I, I talked to a, a doctor and he said to me, you looked scared like you didn't know what you're doing. I said, right on, right on. I was scared to death. I was scared to death. There was never any time to look back. I... Um, I knew it was a tightrope, and as they say, and it's a good metaphor, you can't walk a tightrope and look back, you fall off, which proved to be a successful metaphor. I kept it in mind, and there was nothing that you could do about anything that had gone. You just had to look at these huge decisions that had to be made, and uh, in Nova Scotia, spending money was very difficult. Under these circumstances, it just went out the door. How many refrigerated trailer trucks? Do you need six? We wound up with 16. Um, so it was a very anxious time. A time of great personal challenge that was both physical and mental and emotional. I thought I could die, for sure. I thought I could die. You wonder why? Well, I was foolish. I had found out I had high blood pressure. I had bargained with myself that I would lose some weight, and I didn't. And so the emotional toll was obviously potential, mentally very challenging. I thought I could run away, actually. One morning, I got up. I thought, well, I slept for three hours, two or three hours. I could run away. You want to run away? I'll run away. I think only the thought of what the headlines would say <laughs> stopped, <laughs> certainly stopped me from running away. There was nothing but goodness. I've tried to think of another word. There was nothing but goodness. It was incredible to work there. One day, um, I had a phone call from an important person with Swiss Air, Friday, the 4th of September. Would you come to a meeting? 
uh, six or seven of us paraded through a back door onto a dais in the Nova Scotian, uh, the Lord Nelson Hotel, rather, and I um, found myself on a platform with naval officers, Coast Guard officer, President of Swiss Air, Vic Gurdon from the Transportation Safety Board. You've heard if you followed Swiss Air as the lead investigator, and a sea of very sad-looking people, about 300 family members and as many caregivers. And there I was faced with the problem that I could no longer shut the door. <coughs> and I had to tell the families about this, that what they had to endure was not only the death, but also the fact that they would never ever see their loved one again. And it began a relationship which I don't think there's uh, much contact left, although I'm still in touch with one or two of the families, but it began a relationship which allowed for the laying on of hands again. And. Uh, touching people uh, properly and sensitively and grieving. There was enormous goodness in the whole thing. To the extent that one day I was in the morgue, I didn't do much pathology. I, I, w I was a manager more than anything, and one day I was in the morgue and it was early on, and I said to Lloyd O'Neill, who was the Catholic chaplain, and around a lot, and a wonderful man, I said to him, this is such a good place. There is so much spirit. There is so little of yesterday. There's no looking back, all these things that I've told you. And he said to me, doctor, there are a lot of souls hanging around here. That's why it's such a good place. It was, without question, the best place that I've ever worked in my life. That's what I said on the slide. It was utterly incredible how people related to one another and how they did their jobs in this dreadful, dreadful situation that you saw of what they were dealing with. And the remains that you saw that were all in little bits and pieces came from the floor of the ocean a year afterwards. And as I said to people who wanted to know, and people did want to know, the forces of nature have left all the soft tissue. And, and that what you saw there was bone, only bone. But in the beginning, it was, it was, just, it was just dreadful. And you could imagine the people who had never been experienced in this. So who had been? Nobody was prepared for this. The sailors out in the ships, the people who were working in the flotsam and jetsam that you saw floating on the ocean, I can only leave it to your imagination what was in there. And to retrieve this and to see it through to the ultimate was an enormous emotional and physical and mental task. Now, that's the end of my story, really. It was a Canadian thing. And we are, we're great people, we're great people. And Canada just did a great job. Thank you.